Hello everyone, Sanjay Saint here, and I'm really happy that you joined me to learn a little bit about acute dyspnea. This is the first of several videos that um, I'll be presenting along with Dr. Vineet Chopra. He and I wrote the St. Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine, and if you like these videos, um, please think about um, getting the book and learning these approaches since most of what we'll be saying comes from the St. Chopra Guide. We'll begin by the definition of acute dyspnea, and that's the subjective experience of breathing discomfort that occurs over hours or days. And the key aspects of this is first the dyspnea part, which is the subjective sense of difficulty breathing, but then there's also the acute part. And in clinical medicine, we subdivide things into acute, subacute, and chronic based on the tempo of illness. And acute means that it occurs over hours or days, subacute over weeks, and then chronic over several weeks, months, and years. The differential diagnosis is different based on that tempo of illness. Acute dyspnea is a common cause of emergency department or urgent care visits, hospital admissions, and decompensation among hospitalized patients. So if you've admitted a patient and you get called by the nurse that the patient is feeling short of breath, the same differential diagnosis that we'll discuss in the next slide will apply to those patients just like they'll apply to patients you see in clinic, urgent care, or in the emergency department. So these are the 15 most common causes of acute dyspnea and by common causes, things that I want you to remember. And I know that you, you can come up with more than 15, but because I have an MPH, I'm allowed to think in terms of 95% confidence intervals. And usually differentials should be the most common problems or the ones that are most life-threatening. And those are the ones that we're gonna discuss. But before I go through the seven pulmonary causes or respiratory system causes, four cardiac causes and four other causes, maybe you wanna pause the video right now and try to fill them out as well as you can and then compare them with what I'm gonna to provide to you. So first, the pulmonary causes. Pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, airflow limitation, also called lower airway obstruction. This is both COPD exacerbation and asthma exacerbation. Aspiration, which is a clinical diagnosis. Pneumothorax, which we can diagnose when patients have acute onset shortness of breath accompanied by pleuritic or respirophasic chest pain, pain when they take big, a big breath in. Upper airway obstruction, more common in children than in adults, but usually presents with the finding of strider, which is inspiratory wheezing. And then acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, which is a complication of something else. Overwhelming sepsis, severe burns, trauma, etc. So now let's go to the four cardiac causes. And the four cardiac causes are these. Heart failure, very common cause, whether it's uh, due to systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. Myocardial ischemia or infarction, there are certain categories of patients who will develop myocardial ischemia or infarction without chest pain. You'll wanna know who those patients are. They tend to be women, elderly patients, diabetics, and those who have undergone cardiac transplantation. A third cardiac cause are arrhythmias. Shortness of breath, especially accompanied by palpitations or lightheadedness, should make you think that the patient is having an arrhythmia. And finally, pericardial tamponade. Patients sometimes can have chest pain if they have pre-existing pericarditis, which is also respirophasic or pleuritic in nature. Gets better when they lean forward, worse when they lean back, but sometimes they can have such uh, large amounts of fluid accumulate in the pericardial cavity that they actually won't have chest pain and they'll present with what's known as a triad of despair. Elevated neck veins, hypotension, and absence of crackles. And there's only a handful of diagnoses that present with a triad of despair, pericardial tamponade being one of them. And just think for a moment, based on the pathophysiology, elevated neck veins, hypotension, absence of crackles, what the other causes would be. 
And I'll tell you, right ventricular myocardial infarction, tension pneumothorax, and massive pulmonary embolism because of acute right ventricular failure. And then the third and final category of common causes of acute dyspnea are sepsis, because patients with sepsis develop a lactic acidosis, and the compensation is a respiratory alkalosis or hyperventilation. When patients breathe quickly, they'll have a sense of breathing and often feel short of breath. Metabolic acidosis of any type, non-GAP or GAP, because again, the compensation is a respiratory alkalosis. Anemia, because of low oxygen carrying capacity. And anxiety, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, because patients who come in with pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure, this decompensated myocardial infarction, etc., they look like they're having a panic attack. They look very anxious. And the reason they look anxious is because they're near death. And so the anxiety is secondary, not primary. There are four key questions on patient history that you should gather as part of your history of present illness. What was the speed of onset? Was it sudden or was it more gradual? It helps to distinguish between the different diagnoses we just discussed. What are the associated symptoms? Shortness of breath with fever and productive cough leads us down a different cat, uh, pathway than shortness of breath with substernal crushing chest pressure radiating down the ulnar portion of the left arm. What happened just prior to the onset of dyspnea? They just get off a plane flying in coach class going from Australia to the United States. Or did they just go outside or were they mowing the lawn and doing something that was active that could also have led to some irritants? And then finally, what other medical problems does the patient have? Do they have a low ejection fraction? Um, and could they have some dietary non-compliance, which now is the reason for their shortness of breath due to heart failure? Five key areas on physical exam. Of course, we'll do a thorough physical exam, but focus on the vital signs. Any abnormality in a vital sign should alert you to a potential life-threatening problem, even something as seemingly benign as sinus tachycardia. Chest exam, of course, listening for wheezing or, or murmurs or crackles. The heart exam, including jugular venous pressure, will be important. The extremities, to see if the patient is cool and clammy or if they're warm and well perfused, or if they have peripheral edema will be helpful. And then finally, mental status, and we'll return to that when we talk about indications for intubation. Four diagnostic studies that we should do almost on every acutely dyspneic patient, at least the first three. The last one is plus or minus. So think again before I tell you what they are, what you would write down, and maybe you want to pause the video here, just think about this. But these four would be the 12 lead EKG, chest radiograph, ideally a PA and lateral, CBC looking for anemia or evidence of sepsis, and then plus minus a, a blood gas. But a lot of people use the pulse oximeter instead of the uh, blood gas. So in terms of management, we should treat the underlying cause. Because I want these videos to be short and to the point, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but if you diagnose pneumonia, you would treat with the appropriate antibiotics, same thing with pulmonary embolism, with anticoagulants, etc. But regardless of the underlying cause, you always want to ask yourself when you first see an acutely dyspneic patient, do you have to intubate this patient? And these are the four indications for emergent intubation that I run through when I see a patient like this. First, they have refractory hypoxemia. Is there P little AO2 less than 60 despite maximum oxygen delivery? Second, do they have an increasing P-delay CO2 despite therapy, which indicates they may be tiring out and is their work of breathing very high? Third, do they, are they unable to protect their airway? This is where their mental status is important. If they aspirate and then they, or they vomit and then they aspirate, will they develop ARDS or they need some type of procedure and they're not able to protect their airway because they're altered, should we intubate them to protect their airway for them? Or finally, upper airway obstruction. If they actually have upper airway obstruction, intubation won't help. That's when cricothyroidectomy is necessary. But if they are allergic to shellfish, they just ate shrimp unknowingly, they now have strider and hives, 
be very have a very low threshold to intubate that patient until the medication, steroids, etc., will kick in. So thank you for listening to the video. There's a link about our book uh, on this slide, and please feel free to use the uh, promotion code to save up to 30%. Thank you again.